Okay, I found what I was looking for. Unlike you two, they still haven't found what they're looking for. So I, you know, searched a little bit, ended up Googling, well, braving, I guess. <laughs> Whatever, Clang section alignment. So attribute aligned 16 is a GCC or Clang sort of attribute that I can use for alignment. So I could also, I think, use LD for like section alignment, but this ended up working. So in kernel.c here, next to the attribute, because you can have multiple things in an attribute, I just added aligned 4096, which I might be able to do hex as well, because the compiler should just turn that into a constant value anyway. So everything else is the same. I just aligned it there. And just to make sure, I'm still generating an elf file. So I'm just going to remove kernel elf. And I'll make sure, actually, I'll make sure they all, they all are. OK, so let's generate an elf file. And kernel address e2d8000, 24576, entry point e2da. So it is 4kb aligned now. Just wanted to make sure to not run into issues later when I jump to the entry point. I should jump to a valid virtual address, which probably needs to be 4kb aligned. So we'll try it for portable executable files as well with that change. I don't think it would have changed at all anyway, because it's still 4kb aligned. And I'll try it with kernel.bin here, which is generated as an elf file. Well, clang rather, clang directly outputs from the linker, a binary, and that is 4kb aligned, yep, for the disk buffer, which makes sense. It shouldn't really matter. I just want to make sure that stuff's changed and works. So I'll try it as a, a PE file generating with the image base zero and all that. Remove kernel.bin first. And puts it, okay, E2DC, same thing. Just wanna make sure, yep, they both work. All right, cool. Cool beans. And it did run this and then this for, uh, you know what, whatever. <laughs> Let me make sure that none of those are active. And it still works, all right. Okay, I'll go with the uh, elves for now is, is fine. All right, so stuff's allocated and loaded to a, a 4KB address when I'm loading these things. And it works for all three of the kernels and we print the info there. All right, so what else do I need to do? I wanted to remap it. What was my original reasoning? I was remapping things. So I have identity map, a page, and I have, do I have just a map page? Yeah, I just have a map page for virtual, that's unmap. Okay, so this physical and virtual and memory map info, I'm taking in here, all right. I guess one thing I could show, because I'm gonna map this in a second for this. But okay, remapping to higher addresses, that's fine. I would take in the kernel, which I have the kernel buffer that I called it. Kernel buffer in size. So I have these two things. So let's say we have I and I will be, let's say we map all the pages. So we'll say kernel size plus page size minus one over page size. So that's the number of pages. I can make that a, a macro probably. To save typing at all and all. So for all the pages for the kernel, I'm gonna map the pages to higher addresses according to the kernel start address here. So the highest two gigs of memory, hopefully if I had that value correct, I'll map these things in here. So physical and virtual, so physical is not going to work because I don't have that much RAM, <laughs> really. But I can map it to the lower half of memory so that if I refer to the higher, phys the higher virtual address, it actually maps to the correct physical. Yeah, the higher virtual will map to a physical. So the physical address I can use is wherever the kernel buffer is right now. But the virtual address 
I can map to the start of where we want to call it in memory. So this is cool paging stuff. So the kernel start address will have, and I'll map each page, so I'll add you know, i times the page size here. So it'll start at zero, then go 4k afterwards, and then 4k after that, and 4k after that. So each page of, of the kernel, effectively, where it starts, where it's currently at, I'm going to say if we access memory starting at the start address here, that actually is going to refer to the kernel buffer here in physical memory that we allocated from the disk buffer. If that makes sense. Probably doesn't, but... Yeah, we want to pass in memory map info. I'm using kparms, so I'll do that, and we need a pointer. So I'll keep doing that, I guess. Or is memmap a pointer already? And I think that's correct. If I end the statement. Okay, so that shouldn't change anything because I'm not using that memory, but I am mapping it. Including entry point. Well, the entry point will be part of the buffer, so that should be okay. Kparms, I'm not sure. I might have to remap kparms. But it doesn't really matter. It's identity mapped, and we can use it in the kernel later. We could have it all be above the kernel, though. I don't know. I'll worry about that later. Right now, I just want to prove that we can call a higher half kernel. I'll just say note here. So the frame buffer, yeah, I should identity map so we can prove that it still works after we set up paging. And I'll call identity map page instead with whatever the addresses are, given the memory map info. And the frame buffer would be kparms.gop. Right. So we're given, I'm given a GOP mode, which is EFI graphics output protocol mode. And then that is a struct. We have the mode information. We have the blit pixel, blit operation. Where's the mode itself? Output protocol mode, okay. So I'm given the frame buffer base and size within the mode, so I can use those values. So GOP mode is a struct, so I can do that dot, yeah, frame buffer base. So that's where I would start here. And I would map that to itself. But I'd also want to add in I times the page size for each page of the frame buffer. And then we'd have frame buffer size as well. Okay, so instead of kernel size, we would have frame buffer size. Okay, plus page size minus one over page size. And that would be the number of pages. And then we'd map the base plus a page offset for every page of the frame buffer, and I'm identity mapping every page of the frame buffer here from where it starts. Yeah, so that should be all right. Just to make sure, I, I identity map everything to begin with anyway, so this might just be duplicating that work and not really have any effect, but just for argument's sake, we'll do that. Identity map a new stack. So I can do that by allocating allocating a page, which that takes in a void pointer, so we'll have, I'll say kernel stack, we'll just allocate however much we want, we'll say a 16 kilobyte stack, or a 32 kilobytes, a 64 kilobyte stack, that'll probably be okay, so we'll just do that, yeah, so 64 kilobyte stack, Okay, so the global descriptor table and the task state segment and a descriptor that refers to that will need to be set up, so I can do that. I'll probably add the types within my library file here with all the other types. I'll add it down here. TSS, TSS, well, TSS, 
descriptor. So we'll have types for these things. Okay, so that's other things that I had open on my browser and coincidentally the Intel docs, the combined volumes one through four, although I'm really just looking at stuff within chapter three, system programming guide, specifically under protected mode memory management, chapter three and task management for the task state segments and how things look. It might be under eight two actually, yeah. But anyway, chapter three, 3.4 logical linear addresses, three, four, five segment descriptors, that's what I'm looking at. If you want to refer to long mode or 64-bit mode specifically for Intel and their documentation, that is IA32E, which is IA32 extended, which is Intel architecture 32-bit extended mode for 64-bit. They don't call it long mode, but that's fine. IA32 is the old 32-bit protected mode and, and before, essentially. But you can run that in compatibility mode under IA32E, and there's just more acronyms and everything from there. So, okay, segment descriptors, and there's other stuff in here. And it, it makes a lot more sense, and it's actually well laid out and understandable. If you read the docs, you don't have to read all 5,000 pages, but just reading through chapter three, it, it's not very long, and it, it makes more sense. So I recommend doing that, because you would understand more than I do at this point if you do. But all right, segment descriptors are essentially... You have a section of memory with a start and end address and different privilege levels like system or user mode and if it's available, if it's been used, dirty bits and stuff. You have where that segment of memory starts and where it ends, the size of it. And you describe these sections of memory with segment descriptors and a descriptor is a data structure here of uh, 4 and 4, 8 bytes. And a descriptor is put within a segment register, like the code segment or data segment or extra segment, CSDS, ES, for example. And those refer to sections of memory that have a given, you know, start address and how large it is and the type of memory you're defining for that segment. If it's available, if it's for code or data, you know, the granularity, if it's four kilobytes or a two meg page or a one gigabyte page or stuff later. Well, that's in the page tables, but the granularity says if it's like, I think one byte or four kilobytes. And this, this other info about the section of memory. So you have a data structure here of eight bytes that describes a section of memory that you put within a segment register. So this, this data structure is a segment descriptor and a global descriptor table and a local descriptor table as well are, are arrays essentially, are tables of these descriptors. So it's just eight byte values all in a row, similar, kind of like the page tables, but instead of a page, table structure, which goes down to a page, we have an array of segment descriptor structures that describe a section of memory. So at minimum for a GDT, and your firmware has this or else our, our stuff wouldn't load to begin with, we'll need stuff at minimum for a kernel, and if you want to go to user land ring 3 in x86 world, then we'll need descriptors for that as well. So at minimum I'm going to have a 64-bit, not 32-bit, but a 64-bit kernel code descriptor, code segment descriptor, as well as data descriptor. And then also a user 64-bit code and data descriptor, and then maybe a user 32-bit code and data descriptor if we want to run or emulate. If you want to run or emulate 32-bit code later or switch back to protected mode for some reason, such as switching to level 5 paging, which you need to disable paging and go through a, a thing to do that. You may also want 16-bit code descriptors, if not segment descriptors, if you want to mess with like original BIOS stuff, should it still exist on your machine. I'm not going to do that, maybe someday in the future, if it's still supported. But yeah, that's what we'll need here. This stuff describes it a lot better. Or you can look at OS Dev Wiki in there, GDT tutorials and overall page for it, which can help if you want to see things in a different layout. And it's a lot less verbose than the Intel manual, but it explains, you know, a lot less. So that's okay. The segment descriptors will also have to look at, that's an 823. So we'll need a, a GDT table as well. We have the types for system descriptors, not a 64-bit system descriptor though. So segment descriptor tables. This just describes that we load these things. Oh, for the processor to refer to the global descriptor or segment descriptor tables, it needs to know where they're at, and it knows where they're at with a 
global descriptor and local descriptor table register. And the registers, they don't... Okay, they label right above there. In 32-bit mode, they're 48 bits. In 64-bit and long mode, they're 80 bits because we can use 64-bit addresses along with the 16-bit limit. So originally we had 32-bit addresses with the limit. Now we have 64-bit. So the GDTR and LDTR registers take in values for 64-bit that are that looks like this. It's an 80-bit value. The limit is the size of the table you're referring to, and the base address is the address of that table. So I can lay these things out, probably. I can have type def, so I can have... Well, I'll need a type def, probably, really, for the GDTR and stuff. That's referred to as a... Well, it's a pseudo-descriptor. I'll just say descriptor register. Maybe I'm making this too verbose, but that's fine. It should be aligned, but I guess to make sure, well, it should be packed rather and aligned on a one byte or two byte boundary. But just to make sure, we'll make sure. And I'll say it's packed. I'll say descriptor register will be very verbose with it. So I'll have a 16 bit limit. And I have, well, let's just make sure. You can use fixed width types here. So I'll have a 16 bit limit. Yeah, standard int. And I'll have a 64 bit, whatever they called it, base. Don't look at that. <laughs> 64 bit base address. So we'll just have that for descriptor registers. So this will be used for, you know, GDTR and LDTR with assembly. Um, yeah, load GDT and load LDT. I don't remember. Is it LLDT? I mean, it's in the Intel manual, really. I could I could just look them up in the manual, but. <laughs> yeah. Load interrupt descriptor table. Okay, so we don't have a load local descriptor table. But we do have load GDT. So I'll use that. Instruction or opcode, I'll just say instruction. Use this for uh, global descriptor table register with assembly load GDT instruction. Yeah, okay. We also need a descriptor type. Descriptor, e.g., an array of these is used for the GDT, LDT. Okay, I'll say, I'll just put this here because I don't have a key anywhere. I'm gonna have a struct and it should be packed by eight bytes, but we'll see. It should be aligned on an eight byte alignment, but we'll see. I might do a union here and separate things out and do, do bad things like with a bit field. <laughs> but we'll say we have 64 bit value. I know I'm not doing uints 32 and stuff. I guess I could do that for these, couldn't I? I don't know, does it really matter? Then I don't need standard in it. Whatever. Let's say I have a value for a descriptor and I union that with a struct with the values that are, you know, defined within a descriptor. So stuff like, we also need TSS descriptor. Okay, LDT and TSS use their own descriptors like that. I'll do that in a second. Uh, this also describes, yeah, the GDTR register points to the start and base, which we need a null descriptor first, because that's what we do. And every eight bytes, they have a different descriptor, which is contained. This whole table is full of descriptors. We use segment selectors that we don't really have to mess with, but those define... Well, we'll set the bits at the start of the descriptor that refer to those. But anyway, yeah, this describes that. Okay. The different types you can do for task gates, like for the 64-bit TSS, we'll use busy, probably, or available. 
We'll use interrupt trap gates later. The LDT has its own type. These go within the type bits of the descriptor. Code and segment, if it's not a TSS or LDT descriptor, then the type field corresponds to the code or data. So the bits are set from bit 8 to 11 here. Read or write only, execute only, and different things for that. Um, that's when the present flag is clear. So we would set those bits within bits 8 to 11 here, according to the type, if we're doing a coder segment descriptor, for example. But I'm going to lay out these bits, and I'll do that. Okay, I might skip ahead here, because I'm just writing, you know, struct definitions, but anyway. So we have 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 24, 32, 48, 64. Yep, so that looks correct. And then we can refer to these numbers as we want, and that still loads. Okay. All right, and if you want to set the values at once, you can just use value there, so that'll work. So GDT will be an array of these descriptors, essentially. Task state segment descriptor I will need, so that is an 8.3, or 8.2.3, 8.2.3. TSS descriptor in 64-bit mode. Task switching is not supported, but you still need a descriptor. And it also applies to an LDT. TSS or LDT descriptor, I guess, all right. Okay, and it is 4812, 16 bytes, so it's two descriptors wide. The first one actually is pretty much, I mean, it has like zeros in some of the places, but the first one is basically a descriptor here. We have limit 15 to 0, base 23, the type. We just don't have the S flag. And we don't have the L or DB flags. The long mode or whatever the other one was. <laughs> But it's basically just a descriptor. So we'd have x86-64 descriptor, and then after that, we'd have other values here. So we'd have an 8-byte base address. So we'd have base 63-232. This one I might have to make packed just to be safe. Although it should be packed on a 64-bit space here. So we have 8 bytes that are reserved. Um, sorry, eight bits that are reserved. Then I have four bits. So I could space this out for a four, yeah. I'll also have it called reserved one. I'll have eight bits. And then after that, I just have a zero. I'll just call it zero one, that's fine. It's eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, it's five bits. And then we have 13 to 31. Uh, which is what, 32 minus 10 is 22 minus 3, 19 bits, is that correct? 13 to 31. So we don't even mess with the top value anyway, it's just 4 bytes. And since it's all reserved and they're 0, I'll probably just set it all to 0. It doesn't really matter. So base address here is actually 32. Let me make sure that's correct. <laughs> Yeah, 32 and then 32, okay. So this should be really aligned on, on eight bytes here, so that probably doesn't need packed, but yeah. Okay, that's a TDT LDT, TSS LDT descriptor. We don't have the task state segment defined and the GDT would be an array of these. So task state segment as well, we have the task register, which for to descriptors and such, task gate descriptors. This is not the 64-bit task state segment. That's an 8.7, okay. Task management 64-bit mode. Okay, so the task state segment 
So we need this as a data structure because the task state descriptor will point to or refer to this data structure for this task state segment, and this descriptor goes in the descriptor table along with the other descriptors for the GDT. All right, so this is taking me a while and it's boring, but you know, sometimes you don't know. <laughs> sometimes you don't know how stuff works till you explain it badly. So TSS descriptor points to this structure in the GDT. Okay, and this is IOMAP base address reserved and reserve zero for, okay, so it's a hundred bytes. All right, so we have uint32 because they're each four bytes, RSP zero, 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 one, one, two, two, lower and upper, okay. We'll have lower and upper. We'll have, well, I wanted that to be one. Okay, <laughs> RSP1, lower upper, RSP2, lower upper, then we'll have two reserves. I'll just call it reserve two and three. Then we have the IST1. IST1 lower and then upper. And then two, three, four, five, six, seven. So six P. five, six, seven, and then we have two more reserves for four bits, we'll say four and five, and then we have a 16 that's reserved, and then we have IO map base address, so IO map base, okay, so that's the TSS struct here for 64 bit. I guess x86, 64 TSS, I don't know. That's what I went with the naming for before, so that's okay. Since I called it descriptors, I guess I know they're 64 bit here, so I don't have to label these things 64 bit, but whatever. Okay, yeah, we'll go with that. So the GDT would be made up of these values, essentially. Let me move that back. All right, so a GDT and a TSS we can set up here. We can have it in another function. I don't know, I might just do it inline here to be lazy about it. So we will have a bunch of descriptors here. I'll have an array, essentially. I'll call it the GDT. How many? I don't know. We'll have it be static. Well, we'll just have it be calculated for us. So I have a big array of these. Okay, so I can say the first value is going to be something. And I'll probably want it. Yeah, it'll be like this. You can do this a few different ways because I haven't done it like this before. <laughs> so we'll see if this works. Uh, anonymous structs are Microsoft extension. Interesting, okay. Can't do anonymous struct. All right, so be struct bits. <laughs> Why is that an anonymous struct? Oh, for this? Oh, because I just called it a descriptor. Uh, yeah, I'll just call that descriptor then. Okay. So do I still need that for here? Nope, okay. Anonymous structs is a type in there is a Microsoft extension. That's interesting. wonder how you'd refer to that, but okay. So this will be the null descriptor. This kernel stack is making me mad, so I'm going to... I don't, I don't like the stupid warnings here that I'm not using it. Uh, unexpected, okay. Oh, 
Okay, yeah, unused variable, that's fine. Uh, okay, so we need the null descriptor as the first one, according to the Intel docs. It's not used, but we just need it for alignment or other reasons. And then we'll have other ones in here. We can mess with the bits or do things on our own, like copy from other stuff, <laughs> like the GDT tutorial. So I'll probably be doing this. We need the null descriptor. Kernel code, mode segment, data segment, user code, user data, which they just call it access byte and flags instead of laying it out how Intel has it laid out. And then the task state segment, initial base will be the address and the size. Okay. Dot. Yeah, I might lay this out a different way. Just lay out an example. I'll do that. That might be easier. And then I can lay out the descriptors here so it makes more sense. So if I have a type for GDT instead, we'll have a descriptor, which would be the null descriptor. We'll have one that'll say be kernel code and data. This might make more sense. We'll have descriptors for user code and data. And then that's probably it. We need a task state segment as well, which would be a descriptor. For TSS, but that won't be the TSS, but it will refer to it. <laughs> it's a little confusing there with the name. Uh, okay, so I can label these further because we'll have user code 64. You may want user kernel code 32 if you want to switch to five level paging or something later. So you'd have stuff in here like this. Maybe you want user code 32 to be able to run 32 bit code. Maybe you want to be able to use sys enter and exit and maybe other instructions that need their own segments. You can add those afterwards, right? And do that. So we'll just say this is an example. Yeah, that makes more sense if I lay it out like that. Okay, so GDT, we'll have GDT. And then we can say, you know, null is, is zero and all that. So I probably will need double. Do I need double here? Because that's in an, that's kind of nested. Actually, it would be null.value, wouldn't it? Might not need trying to think how would I do sort of compound literals here. That's how you do it? Okay. <laughs> okay, that's fine. We'll just do that then. I'll set the values up. All right, TSS, I don't have a value though. I have to do different stuff. TSS.descriptor.value. We can do nested, I think. And then the base has to be other things. So I'll have to lay out different stuff here. We'll need the different base values for a TSS. You know, blah, blah, blah. Mm, okay, so that'll work. Okay, so I'm going to lay out the values here. I just wanted to make sure I remembered how compound literals work. <laughs> but I'm going to lay out values such that the bits correspond to the right base and limits and privilege levels for kernel versus user and type and, and these other ones. That'll just take me a while to remember and go through here according to how this stuff is laid out in the Intel docs.
and I'd like this video not to be four hours long that I'm gonna have to split up anyway. So I'm gonna do that and I'll be back in a few. So see you then. All right, I'm back. See how far I can get with this. Not sure if I can finish it out tonight or not, but we'll see. We'll see how far we get. So I filled out the GDT, the global descriptor table here with some values and I just have the bits set up here on the right. Kind of go back and forth. So these I laid out, you know, the limit base type and all these according to how the Intel docs have it, Intel manuals for section 345, segment descriptors, laid it out like here. I had a TSS because it is required, but the only thing that's really required in the actual task state segment, it's just required to sort of exist and point to a valid location in memory. So that's all I kind of set up that for. Uh, the IO sort of permission bitmap base address. <laughs> this points to an offset from the start of the task state segment, which is gonna be empty. So I'm basically just pointing it to the end of the state segment. And if the limit of this, limit described in the descriptor, if the limit is sort of less than the value of where this would be after the TSS, this is kind of, I guess the minimum, uh, the minimum value you can set it to is just the size and it works, but if it's set to this and it doesn't go beyond the TSS, then all the bits afterwards are assumed to be one, apparently. I didn't find exactly where that was in the Intel docs, but I saw that online in a couple parts. So I don't really know what that means because I'm not going to mess with the uh, V8086 mode or anything and other IO permission bitmap stuff, maybe way off in the future when I understand what it means, but this works, I think, so I'm, I'm going with that. Uh, the address for this that you need to fill the descriptor with that points to the task state segment is the address of where this is. So I just got a, the address and converted it to a number to be able to shift that and take it, essentially. So the limit for the address, well, the limit is the size that we're working with, which is just the size of it, zero based, so minus one. And then the address goes into the base address for the TSS here. So I'm just taking the lowest 16 bits of that address and then the next byte. So you can shift over by 16, then you can shift that over by 24 and the next byte there, the next eight bits. The type for that comes from the Intel docs and that corresponds to the, the same type field in the descriptor, which are bits eight to 11 and nine or 1001 for a system descriptor stands for a 64 bit TSS available. And that's in a chart in the Intel docs. I can show that in a bit. And I'm just setting it as present. That's the only thing there. Um, if that was a little more confusing than the regular sort of values here. So I took these from uh, the internet, of course, the OS Dev Wiki. Helpful as always, I just kind of copied their things here for the 64-bit kernel code and data, user code and data, and also the 32-bit values. And then, you know, the task state segment. What may be a little confusing at first glance is that the user data and well, the user data for 64-bit or for long mode and 32-bit or compatibility mode or what have you, those are the same value here. They have all the same flags and limits and all. And the reason that is is because if the processor is running in long mode, then it'll know, well, from this long mode flag as well, but it'll know it's in, when the code segment is running, it'll know it's in 64-bit long mode. So it'll know the user data by the, the description, privilege level, the DPL bits, but it'll know it's in long mode if we're running in a 64-bit code segment currently. We'll know it's in 32-bit if we're running in a 32-bit code segment. So those can be the same, interestingly enough. The only thing that really changes between those is going to be the descriptor privilege level from 0 to 3. Um, but anyway, these I just put this side by side so you can see that the bits line up here. The limit, the lowest limit is going to be, I, I just set it to the max, really. It doesn't matter. It's kind of ignored, but I set it to the max anyway to be consistent with how 32-bit code would would look at it on the base is going to be zero because I want all of memory and that's still probably ignored for these in long mode. The type changes. The type will be up here because what do we have? Limit is 16 bits and then we have a base of 16 bits, which would be another four. And then this, this base here is going to be the, uh, the next sort of eight bits there. So then we have the type and the type will be a in this case, which is 10 and the types and things will come from these charts in the Intel docs. So 3451, if I'm doing a code segment specifically, I did A right, which would be 1010. So down here, code segments have the top bit set, data does not for these type of bits. So 1010 is here, so execute read. I'm not saying it's access, so no dirty bit or anything, 
But I'm saying we want an executable and readable segments for when we're executing code. Uh, there's conforming, which is good. I don't remember what conforming means, to be honest. Access, read, enable, and conforming. A uh, more privileged conforming segment allows execution to continue at the current privilege level. A non-conforming segment at a different level results in a general protection fault or exception. Let's use a task or call gate. Okay. I'm really probably just going to be doing conforming, I'm assuming, <laughs> to or from user and system code, but you can cause faults and have things handled in your fault handler for more security, I'm assuming, is one, one reason for that. Hardware accesses. But yeah, we'll do execute read here. I guess we could do conforming, but I'm just doing the regular one, non-conforming. In case something bad happens, we'll get a, a protection fault. So yeah, I'm not doing conforming, but I didn't see too much documentation about that online, so I don't know the implications of that just yet. Anyway, but that's this flag here for the type. That's those bits. The system descriptor I'm setting to zero because it'll stand for a code data segment. If it is one, where's that at again? Code data segment, it is set. So a system segment, a, a task state segment or local descriptor table, a sorted descriptor there, that's gonna be zero. A coder data segment, it is set. So if I have nine, I have one, zero, zero, one. For sort of the, the present flag is gonna be one, the DPL is gonna be zero. Those bits for a, a system descriptor, kernel code. And then S is going to be one for a code data segment, not a system descriptor. So that's why that's a nine. It's these four bits here. Then we have the other limit I set to the max, which is F. So that combines with the lower Fs to have the highest thing we can set. Although again, for 64-bit mode, those are kind of ignored, I believe. And after that, we have a, which are the next four bits, which will be these, because the top two bits are base, which is going to be the base address, so zero. So available, what am I doing? I'm doing 1010, so I said it's not available, which doesn't seem right, but I guess that's what I put. Uh, set the granularity flag to one for four kilobyte, that's right. Default stack size upper bound flag. Long mode is set. I guess one would be not available, is that what that was again? because I do not remember. Uh, this is available for use by system software. Okay. Oh, it's just a free bit. Okay, you can do whatever you want with available. I left it clear. <laughs> I thought it meant like if, I don't know, some different meaning for available. L should be one if you're in 64-bit code. So if that's not set, 32-bit code, then the processor knows if you're in compatibility mode or long mode, or sorry, if you're in protected mode or long mode for 32-bit. I think I said compatibility earlier and I didn't mean to. DB, if it is a code segment specifically, and this is determined by those type bits, bit eight to 11, if it's a code segment and it is set, we're assuming 32 bits, if it's clear, 16 bit, or you can override with the override instruction prefix, prefixes. Stack segment would be for a data segment. We might wanna keep that clear, expand down, I guess if, otherwise if it's not a stack segment, so it's not pointed to, it's a regular in another regular data segment. Then the upper bound is the top of memory, essentially. Okay. So if I did A, I'm doing 1010. So I just have these two. So the DB flag is clear. Which assumes these, but I think it's maybe different for long mode. Maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but the system descriptor types, so the TSS is different. I did a 9, right, which is 1001. In IA32 mode, that's 64-bit TSS available. And that is where the type bit here comes from. That's why I did 9 here for the task state segment descriptor specifically. But if you go through and you, and you read these, and you can make more sense of it than I can probably, <laughs> that's why I chose these values. So the user code changes basically in the in the type flags well in these flags i just have these two sets so i still have the same 9 
Yeah, the type I have set to a 2 there for data. I just want to verify that these are correct. So 0001 is data read-only accessed. But I have a 2, not a 1, so it is, yeah, okay. It's read-write. That seems right. Not doing conforming for code. So it's just read-write. I guess I could tell it to expand down. Maybe it does that by default. Or it only matters for a stack segment. That's the change. That's the only change there, other than the top bit. C would be 1100 for 12. So I have the D slash B flag set for data and clear for code. So for data, if it is set, then it does the, the upper bound, the max upper bound of memory. Okay, so that's why that one is set. Okay, so those would be those changes there for data. The user code, what changes? Yeah, P, D, P, L, and S be these three. So these are all set for user and not for kernel because the description privilege level is set to three. So two bits binary one one is three, and that is the level three for user user land. Effectively, it's ring level three, so that should be set to three for the privilege level. In kernel code, that is set to zero. Just the present and discrete code segment flags are set, which is why this is nine and this is F. PPL is three, kernel is zero. Those are the only changes really for kernel and user code for 64-bit, just the nines or Fs. So for 32-bit, set of AF, AF9A, I have CF9A. So these both are set. So I'm setting the D slash B flag, it looks like, for kernel, for 32-bit mode. Yeah, okay, so I guess it doesn't matter as much for long mode, or maybe you have to have it clear, but... So it, should, it would normally be in 32-bit mode, assuming you're using 32-bit addresses and everything. Okay, this should always be set to 1 for 32-bit code and data, and I guess 0 maybe for long mode as well, because it's not set on the long mode one. So that's for 32-bit, using 32-bit code and data, and that's why that's always C and not, not A. And then the difference between kernel code and data is that type field here. And the type field is 0001 for a readable writable data segment instead of 1010 for a readable executable code segment. And the difference between kernel and user code for 32 bits, again, is the privilege level. So instead of being 1001, it's 111 for level 3 and 1 for being called from user code. And then the 64-bit data is the same as 32-bit for user because the processor will know implicitly if it's running in 64-bit code or not. So it'll know if we're supposed to be evaluating 32-bit addresses and everything by that DB flag being set and we're running in 32-bit processor mode instead of long mode. I'm assuming is how that works, but that's why the flags are laid out. I don't think they explain that as well, or maybe they probably explain it better than I do on one of these pages. <laughs> Maybe not on this one, but on their regular GDT one, they probably do. Not the tutorial page. Yeah, they say all the things here. Direction conforming instead of D or B. If one, it grows down. I'm assuming we'd want that to be grow down, usually. Equal or lower privilege level. That makes more sense. Highest privilege level allowed to execute the segment. Yes. Okay. All right, the only other tricky thing is, if I didn't mention it in the last part, that the, the TSS is a task state segment, and the descriptor in the GDT is a task state segment descriptor, which has a normal descriptor. Well, it has its own special one, but it's basically a normal descriptor, and then an extra one for the upper 32 bits of the base address, because it's a 64-bit address, to refer to the task state segment. So just the descriptor for it and the segment itself are two different data structures. That's just... It's a little unclear sometimes, I think. Okay, so those are the pages for that. I don't know if I added new to-dos or other things. I think this is new, I added. Uh, what else did I do for, for new markings? 2434, 2481. I guess I can just search for it, right? <laughs> Okay, 
So the other things I added for new are I added comments for it. Clean up pages for the allocated kernel buffer. Okay, so if we didn't get, this I didn't put in the last part, so I marked things with new again. If we did not get an entry point, if it was void from loading a file or it didn't work for some reason, we don't have the entry point, then I want to free the pages that have been allocated with allocate pages to the four kilobyte address that we're using that's returned for that entry point. So instead of just going to clean up, I want to free the pages first. So I will do that with free pages, but I don't think I had that. Um, I don't think I added that yet because I didn't have allocate pages either. It's right there. Yeah, I don't have that. Okay, so I'll add that in. I'll add it under allocate pages. Which is in some other section, I don't know. That would be in the UEFI spec. So do I have pages here? Boot services, memory allocation, free. So it's in 722, and I'm just going to grab that. Just returns the memory allocated by allocate pages. We pass it the number of pages and the starting address that we want to free from. Free fry fro from. Okay, physical address, so not a pointer, just a plain address and the number of pages. So this is in 722. Okay, so then I can call free pages from the kernel buffer, which is not the entry point, but in this case it is because it's the start of the buffer for a flat binary. Otherwise, it is the buffer that the file was allocated into with allocate pages. So that should be all right. And the size or the number of pages we'd want to free for that is going to be, since it's in pages, yeah, I can just divide by the page size. And that should be all right, because when I'm allocating that, like in load elf here, I'm getting the number of pages and I'm allocating that many pages. So the size I'm setting to the page size. Okay, so it will always be a multiple of page size from these. Hopefully also from disk buffer from read LBAs, read disk LBAs to buffer. Am I using allocate pages in here? I am, okay. Pages needed, yep. Okay, so that will always be a multiple. Of course, how do I know? The kernel size is the file size. I don't know if this is gonna be in pages necessarily. Cause that's just the file size. So where do I, do I read that in here? I do, that's not necessarily in pages. I probably wanna make sure that's in pages here. In case I call it, there might, it might be like one page off, which might not be good. I can mod it by the page size and then divide by, hmm. I don't know. I think ultimately this will work. It just might be one page off. But if we're going to like clean up and do things, I don't think that's that big of a deal, but that's something to keep in mind that I'm going to forget about. So maybe that'll be one page off for a flat binary. I don't know. But anyway. Uh, and the other new thing I added, I'll take this off now. As long as it compiles, it does. Still loads. All right. So the next thing was actually mapping the kernel buffer pages. So before... Yeah, before I had the kernel buffer, but I was allocating all the pages to the higher address, but not from the original lower address. So the kernel buffer, <laughs> if I just used that, that would map all the pages for the higher address to the same address of kernel buffer, and that's not good. I want to actually map all the pages that was allocated, that were allocated. So I need to increment by the page size for the address to map to physically from the, the virtual address. I need to do all the pages for both. Right, so that's that's new. I wasn't doing that before, and that would be better. Um, and then to actually map the stack, I think I was just doing like 16k times four or whatever here, stack pages. So I just made a, a constant for that. You could do a define. I don't know. I did a constant for whatever whatever reason. Although C23 has constant expression, I guess not in this version. Uh, yeah, because I'm on C17 still. So if I want to do that, I can just set it to map the stack pages and then multiplied by the page size would be 
the amount in pages. So 16 times the page size would be the amount of bytes for that many pages. And since that's allocated to this address, I'm just initializing it to zero. I could probably change this function to initialize the memory. I'm not for whatever reason, but I do want to initialize it. So that would be good. I set the number of pages there and then to map those pages. So that's mapped in our new page tables. I'm just going through an identity mapping all the pages of this allocated stack here uh, by converting that, yeah, just to an int for the function and every page address starting at the start of this memory up until the maximum size. Given that memory map, so that sounds all right. I think that'll be okay. Okay, any more new things that I did? Nope. All right, so that was it. Okay, I did add more to-dos, though, probably. Like getting the other kernel address and doing these things that I've never done yet. Place initializing it. I don't really need to do that if it works, really. But it, this will probably... Does this work now? Maybe this only works with Clang, which is why I didn't do that. So I think there was a reason. Mm, that might work with both. Well, let me clean it and then do it. No, that works with both. Okay. I thought that would give me an error if I did that. I guess not. Just making sure. Yeah, it doesn't. Okay. Well, I'm fine with that. Any other one, like here? Yep. Okay. I'll just check that for both, make sure it still compiles, we're good. And I exited out too early so it didn't load. There we go. Okay. So I added, I think this was new since the last part, my to-do here. Still don't know if I want to remap the parms, probably might do that. I want to remap the higher address entry point as well, because that's what we want to call. If we load the kernel to a higher address, we want to call it at that higher address. So the entry point that I'm getting when I'm loading the L for PE or flat binary, that's still in the lower sections of memory. It's not mapped starting at the higher, the higher kernel start address for like the last two gigs. It's not, it's not there, right? It's at wherever the firmware put it probably in the lower under two gigs, I'm assuming, memory. So I want to get a sort of equivalent address for the offset from the new higher address of memory. So my little pseudocode here was getting an entry offset. Say as just a 64-bit a, a architecture specific size here. So we get the offset here from the original entry point minus the start of wherever the, the file was loaded to, which is gonna be the start of the buffer. So just the buffer itself, that's fine. But that is, is that a physical address? Okay, but the entry point is a void pointer. So offsets, I could do a physical address, it's fine. It's gonna be 64 bit anyway. And that is a sort of equivalent offset we can use to get the higher entry point so higher, higher half for kernel entry, or I'll say new entry point, higher entry point. I don't know what you want to call it. It'd be the same as the original entry point here, which is a void pointer. No, void EFI API. I just called it entry point. I might make a type def for that. I think that would be better. Yeah, let me make a, a type diff for that. Which would be fine. So entry point kernel parm. So let's do type diff. Uh, void if I API. I'll just call it entry point and it'll take in these as parms. Is that how you do a type diff? I don't remember. <laughs> For a for a function pointer. All 
Undeclared identifier. Yeah, because I messed up calling that. But I did an error on the other thing. Mm, no, that works. All right, cool. That works. Anyway, I can do entry points. Say higher entry point, which would be kernel start address, which if I want to make sure it's unit in size, it should be, but I just want to make sure. We'll do that. It'll say they're unused, incompatible pointer to int conversion. Oh, it didn't like that. Um, entry point with things. Oh, that's true. That's true. Mm, okay, we can do the original entry point. I want to do that plus the offset. Right, but it's not going to like me doing this. So what if I cast it like that, huh? Oh, it's okay with that. <laughs> Probably not great, but that's all right. So the original entry point as an address plus the offset. Um, I just need the offset actually for the kernel start address. Sorry, I know I had that before. Okay, so it, it's it's okay with that. So yeah, we're just taking a byte address. We're adding the same offset that the original entry point was from the start of its buffer. We want to map it to a higher address, so it's the same buffer kind of overlaid or copied to a higher starting point, and I just want to get the same offset from that new starting point, right? Have that be the new entry point. So that's what we'll do there, because that'll work when we actually call the function, hopefully. Does this still work with the type diff entry point? It does, all right, that's good. Okay, what else is... Oh yeah, because I got rid of that. So there's not, nothing else new. Is there any to-dos? There are. Actually setting the page tables, now that all the stuff is set up now and mapped, hopefully. We'll find out. This I want to be the higher entry point, but... I'll leave that there till we do this stuff. This stuff will have to be an inline assembly as we call it, so I'll test calling that. So I do want to do this before setting them. I can just do it on here, really. Yeah. Uh, we'll just do that. Do it like this. We'll have inputs, inputs, outputs, and then clobbers. Oh, didn't want to do that. Clobber, we'll probably put memory just to make sure it doesn't mess with it even more so than doing volatile, and we'll probably mess with memory. Okay, so to do it on each line, we'll at least need a new line here. I think uh, GNU inline assembler might actually need a tab and a new line, but just a new line usually works, if not a semicolon. But new line usually works in more situations, so I'll do that. Okay, so set the new page tables, so that would be moving something into CR3. A different thing, well we can just do, we can do move Q, because it's larger. Yeah. So we can have zero, or if you have a lot of different parms, which we might have here, you can do named parameters. So I'll do like, you know, PML4, that's fine. And we'll move that into CR3 which may or may not need the markers here, I don't remember. So that's output, so as input, we can say PML4 is gonna mark just a general purpose register, I think, R would work for that. Or we can set specifically AX or A to do that, but I think R hopefully would work for this, and we'll say that's gonna be our variable. So this is a parameter marker for a constraint, right? And then what we actually set within that constraint, this is going to be our PML4 variable, which is going to be this up here, which is a, a pointer. We'll have that value put into CR3 so it knows the base address of the page tables. That's why that will be there. Unexpected. Oh, I need the, the last colon there, yeah. <laughs> okay. Keep saying GDT. I'll use GDT in a second if you don't mess up my jump list, that'd be great. Okay. So we need to set a new GDT with L 
with load global descriptor table. And there is a store function or a store opcode as well for store global descriptor table. So you could set a memory location, the size of a descriptor register, so 80 bits memory location. For a system descriptor like this, no, not like that, sorry. Descriptor register like this with the limit and the base. You know, you could have a variable for this or set an address for this in assembly or wherever. And you could do store global descriptor table, SGDT, and read into where you put that that memory, that uh, descriptor register. So you could, you could read and print out what the firmware provides, I think, if your firmware doesn't give you like a... If it's in readable memory, it doesn't give you a protection fault or anything. You should be able to read and get the values for what the firmware provides on boot. I might make a menu option for that to read and check the, the default on load on boot descriptor tables. That might be interesting. Still thinking that through. I might not do it on camera, but we'll see. There's also task register, which we'll have to load, I think, with the new TSS. So I'll do that. So load global descriptor table, uh, which might just be... I can just set GDT and it might be able to work from memory, but that would take in a descriptor register. So do I have a descriptor register? I don't think I do. I'll put that after here. So I'll say GDT. Well, I already have GDT, don't I? <laughs> GDTR. I'll just call it that. So it has a base and a limit. It has a limit than a base, rather, if I want to do that order. So the limit is going to be the size, right? How far it has to look to a point to this GDT value. So that would be the size of our GDT. So we can just do that. Minus one because zero based indexing. So it points to byte zero up to the limit, which is going to be the size. So zero base would be minus one from the size. And the base would be the base address. That's why it's 64-bit, it's a memory address. And we can do, well, UN64, UNN for the address of the GDT. That would be the address of the GDT. So if I want to load and use that, I can do that from the GDT register, let's say. And, or we can have it be in memory. G, I don't remember what these do. I think G is maybe memory, some general purpose thing. So sometimes it's hard to debug inline assembly because you don't know what exactly messes up. You just know something in here is bad. So I might run into that. I don't know. We'll find out. This will be GDTR. So hopefully it just loads that into wherever and takes it. We might. I, I might just do memory, actually. I'll say we'll take GDTR for memory, and that, that should be okay. So load new GDT from GDTR register. I need to set, this sets the new page tables, which means anything I refer to afterwards will have to be a virtual address, but since I identity mapped everything, that should be okay. I need to load the task state segment, so that's LTR, load task register. Okay, so if I want to load the task register, load new task register with new TSS value, task state segment. So this has to point to the segment within the GDT that, that is where the TSS is. So this is an offset into the global descriptor table, and I'll put TSS there. And the offset would be, I think it has to be a register as well. The offset for that has to be whatever the numeric offset is sort of in bytes from the start of the GDT. So the null value is offset 0. This one is offset 8 because these are all 8-byte values. This is 16. This is 24. This is 32. This is 40. This is 48. This is 56. This is 64. TSS is after 64. That's 72. So in hex, that is uh, 48, I believe because 64 would be 40, so I think this would be 48. And it also has to be, I think, a 16-bit value. It might have errors otherwise, so I'll cast that. 
So offset into GDT. And just to make sure my GDT value, so I'll do this. Okay, this will be 8, this will be 16, this will be 24, this will be 32, this will be um, 40, yeah, 48, 56, 64, and 72. Yep, that makes sense. So that, that would be 48. All right. And we'll want to load the new stack and do other things as well, so let me look up how to do that again. Okay, so we'll want to jump to new code segment in the GDT, which will be, you know, offset in GDT of kernel or system code segments, I guess 64-bit. Okay, so we'll have like a label here, which is fine. We can say, if we want to use local labels, we can say one, we can say, you know, new CS, we can call it whatever. Um, I'll call it one, because then I can do like jump one F or whatever if I have it here. So I'm going to have to load a new code segment and instruction pointer value, so a CSIP pair for x86 here. And we'll do that by taking the address of this, but I want it to be position independent. So I can say we can push, and sometimes you need the Q for quad. Some versions of GCC and Clang you don't, some versions you do, but uh, friends run into trouble with that. Yeah, so I can, I can push the code segment value and then the instruction pointer value. So the code segment value would be eight in my case. And you can have this be more dynamic than hard coding. But my kernel code here is at offset eight and I want that to be the offset for my code segment that I'm gonna use. So I'm pushing that and then I also need to push another value. So I found it's easier to just load into a register first for this. So I'll load into a 64 bit value, I'm gonna load an effective address into RAX, and I want to load the instruction pointer. So I want to load an AT&T syntax that's a little, a little different. I want to load the address of this point to load the instruction pointer just to go on immediately from this point at the new code segment value. So I need a pair that's like a, a code segment offset by whatever this address is within that code segment here. And the code segment, again, will point to all of memory effectively just with these flags. So it's the same point in memory here in this program, but we're just setting the new code segment so that everything works from this point on. And we can jump to the kernel and everything. So if I wanna load the offset from that segment here, I need to load wherever this label is in memory. And if I want it to be position independent, I can use rip relative addressing. And this isn't correct right now. I have to do source into dest. So I don't remember if it's a dollar or not. I don't think it's a dollar actually, but I can do rip relative addressing. This might have to be percent. So this is sort of saying RIP plus one F, which is the address of this forward label with a one. So this offset by whatever that is, pass this instruction, and I'm gonna load that into RAX. And then I'm gonna push that value onto the stack. So we'll have the code segment followed by the instruction pointer value. And then one way to get both of those and set the code segment and instruction pointer, since there's a couple, at least one instruction that you would normally use, like in 32-bit mode, that we can't use in long mode, one way to do that is to do a, a far return and an at and syntax, you can do a long or L return Q, <laughs> it looks kind of weird, but that's effectively doing a far return, which is going to pop the address from the stack like a normal return, but it'll also pop the code segment to use after that, or the value to push into the code segment. So we push the code segment and the value we want to use for the instruction pointer and the new code segment, and we're popping those values here, and effectively that's going to say go to the address of this label and start executing code from there. 
So that's what this is doing. So we should have execution after this point if, if everything's good. Then we can do whatever other setup we need to do, like setting the new stack and jumping to the entry point. Okay, so let's do, um, let's say executing code with new code segment now. Set up, uh, we'll say remaining segment registers that aren't really used in long mode, although FS and GS are used for specific things in long mode, but I'm not going to go over that because I don't have experience using them yet, like in kernel code. Uh, so we'd want to set like the data registers and such. So I need to move the offsets of the segments I want to use in the segment registers, which is why they're called segment registers. So our kernel data 64, because we're still execu executing in, in system land, not user land. So I want to put the offset or the byte offset from the GDT for the data segment that I want to use here. And I want to move that into the remaining segment registers. So I'm going to move, we'll say 10, which would be a, a literal value. So I need a dollar for ATC syntax, I think. And we'll move that into, say, RAX. And we'll move that value into the segment registers so this will be uh, data segments to use so this is 64-bit kernel data segments offset and gdt so i'm going to move that into the segment values which is going to be uh, the data segment which is ds i don't know if these need a percent i think they do yeah i think these need a percent sign so we'll have the data segments Register, we'll have the extra segments. And I'll do the other extra segments as well, which these also have different connotations in long mode, but it's fine to just set them equal right now. Extra segment, I don't know, two and three, whatever. These also have different um, uses in long mode. I'll just say that. You can look that up on your own. Okay, and then we need this stack segment lastly, I think. So that'll point to where our executable stack is going to be along with the stack pointer. Not in the base pointer, but we can set that up for stack frames and stuff manually, or the compiler does that for calling conventions. But the stack pointer SP is used along with the stack segment to know where the stack is located in memory. So the stack segment will point to, if you set up a specific one or just a data segment, you know, our kernel data is all of memory in 64-bit mode. And then our stack pointer can be an offset into all of memory, <laughs> basically. So I'll do uh, set new stack value to use for SP, etc. Okay, and I believe that'll grow, will that grow up or down? Because I used the flag for, I think maybe grow up, but I don't know. The DB flag is not set, so it's probably not right. No, the DB flag is set, so I think that'll grow down. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> went over those a minute ago and I don't remember. But I need to move into the SP something, RSP, I guess, because we're doing quad. So I'll move the stack that we set up, which is going to be 16 pages or 64K by default. So that is an address here with kernel stack. I can probably use that. At least that's why I set it up. So I'll say stack. And I'll set that here, maybe on the next line. So stack will be, could be a register, could be memory. Yeah, I'll just set G for, I think, general purpose, whatever register. And that'll point to kernel stack. Okay, and since we want a normal grow down kernel, which I think I said, so the kernel will grow downward from some high address. You know, it'll grow down to zero. It'll start at the high address. So we need to start it at the high address, which is the end of the stack that we allocated, which will be the start of the stack. I'll say as a byte value plus the size of it, essentially. So the size is going to be uh, stack pages times page size, because that's the total amount of memory in bytes that we're setting. So I'll yank that value 
and I'll place it there. So that'll be the end of the stack. I'll check in. Ensure order of operations there. So top of stack, top of new allocated stack. So that we need that for the processor to execute correctly. Okay, and then we can call our new entry point and higher memory. You might be able to get away with just calling it in C, but I've had issues doing that before, so I like to just call it here in inline assembly, so that way I know that the processor, that the uh, compiler isn't going to move the instructions around, because this isn't a volatile block with memory constraint here as a clobber, so it shouldn't move this around in that generated code. But it does kind of have free reign to move other things around, so if I want if I want that to work, I'll do it this way, and a a sort of far call or something that works a little bit better. Yeah, I call Q and um, our entry point is a pointer. And I want to go through that pointer, I think. So if I move it into a register, I want to get the value in there. So that'd be the data at that address. Yeah, so I'm going to dereference uh, the entry point and do that. Yeah, so I'm going to have, I think, a memory address, and I'm going to dereference that. Put it in a, a register and dereference that to get the actual value in that register and call that. I think that's how I did it before, so that's what I'm going to try here. Need another comma. And entry is going to be, if I look at the kernel again, I'm using EFI API, right, for my kernel code. So yours might have to change if you're using the Sys5 API or something else. But, but for mine, for the EFI API, I'm setting that as the MS or Microsoft API, because ABI, Application Binary Interface for the Microsoft calling convention, because that's what UEFI specifies, essentially. So that, if I want to look it up, because UEFI doesn't explain the full thing, really. BX is non-volatile. These are non-volatile. Uh, what is pushed for the thing here? RCX is an argument, so... I know RCX has to be the argument, and I'm pushing sort of a, a data structure for the kernel parameters, so it should probably be converted to a pointer and stuff. What I can do is put the, the kernel parms within CX, which would be on input, and the entry, I just need a free parm here, and BX is non-volatile, so I'm going to make it an RBX for the MSABI. And that would be the higher entry point I set at the higher address, which I think I called, what, higher entry point? Yeah, higher entry point, that's what I called it. So I'll put that that pointer value, I'll put that into RBX, and I'll dereference that to call the code there, which will be the entry point for the kernel and the higher address in memory. Okay, and then for the MSABI, I'm going to put the parameters, the KParms, into RCX, by specifying C here. Yeah, I'm going to put the parameters and our CX, and looking at the code I wrote before <laughs> in that little cut there, I can actually just do a, gener a, a register here. A general register would probably just work fine, but our CX specifically has to be for Microsoft ABI, the first parameter. And if I want to ensure that's a pointer, I can say we get a pointer to those, to that data structure. So um, I guess we can do kernel parms pointer, which would be called the kparms pointer. And that will just be the address of kparms, essentially, which is what I called, yep, those addresses. Okay. And is that what I had actually in the... I'll have to change that on this side as well. I'll have a pointer. So my my kernel entry point I'm changing to take in a pointer just to make it easier because I don't want to mess with data structure parms. I can say we have a singular parameter and it's a pointer and that will go in RCX for the Microsoft ABI. So I'll have to change these values uh, from dots to arrows to dereference, but I'll just get a pointer to that for RCX as first parameter for 
Microsoft ABI, say x86-64, Microsoft ABI. That's why that's there. And then I can just put that pointer value into CX for RCX here. Uh, first parameter will be kparms, pointer, and rcx, cx, can't type. And we'll say input constraints below. Okay. Or msabi, all right. Yeah, I don't think I need anything else here. Hopefully that works. I know the kernel's not going to compile. Unexpected token and argument list. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Because uh, I didn't do dollar and I put a colon. That would be why. Yep, and then that says, yeah. Okay. So let me change these. So kargs is going to be a pointer. So I need to dereference these essentially. So I can do an s to substitute to make that a little easier. Just one line there. Then I have that here, and there, and I think that's it. Okay, so just change those to pointer dereferences. Okay, and that compiles, so let me just get that off the screen. All right, so moment of truth, probably not going to work, but sometimes you don't know. This should be loading the kernel at a higher address. So this address, I'm going to change to say the kernel higher address, because this is the lower address. Hey, it loads though. Hey, and it, it actually stopped executing after a few seconds, which didn't work on my hardware. So I need to check this on the laptop, right? But as far as emulation works, we are, uh, it might not seem like it to you, but as far as emulation right now, we are setting new page tables, albeit it's all identity map stuff that was already there to begin with, but new runtime memory as well. Loading a new GDT with the task state segment loading a new address, jumping to it for a new code segment, and loading new data segments to go along with that new code segment, and a new stack to set up the stack, calling the entry point at a higher address. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure why I have to dereference this, but I found that it works if I dereference it instead of calling it directly. That was why I said it, because technically it's a pointer and I have to dereference. Oh, okay, yeah, because it's a pointer. That makes sense. So I, I, that's why I have to rubber duck debug live. So the entry point here is defined as a pointer. It's a void pointer, right? Just with msabi. So I have to dereference that to get, you know, the value that's that's void, but it's coming from calling the function with these parms. But this is a function pointer, so I have to dereference to kind of get the function at that address, so to speak. That's why I have to do that star to dereference that. Anyway, confusing because I'm confused. Um, and if this messes with anything we could say it's rax if we use rax specifically because i do use that here so i think we can say we clobber rax it doesn't really matter but that might help it for optimizing a little bit but that loads so that's good i should test with calling these things is that the only to do oh table info for acpi i'm not doing but anyway okay So set new page tables, GDT, call entry point with parms. All right, so I'm doing that. Yeah, that works. That works out. We're calling it. We'll have built-in unreachable. Cool beans. So let me set the new stuff for the entry point up here, which was here. I'll say original kernel address. And that's the entry point. And I'll put a new, new one down below. And we'll say higher address entry, entry point. All right, is that after this point? 2432-228-2487, yes, okay. But I kind of do that stuff first, don't I? This sets the parms, identity maps. Let me put that back. So where am I doing? Sorry, I don't remember where I'm doing stuff. <laughs> Exit boot services is up there. 
before I'm setting the kernel parms, so I'm going to do this stuff after I get the entry point so I can print out the info. <laughs> All right, because I can't I can't use printf because I can't use the the console out after I exit boot services. So I wanted to make sure that this was before that point. Okay, but I should be able to do it here. Uh, okay, yeah. So the higher address entry point, the offset apparently is is two two thousand. Yeah, because it would be the original e two d eight thousand. The entry point is at e two d a zero zero zero. So that minus the starting point of e two d eight thousand is is two thousand in hex. So two thousand in hex added to the kernel start address at the higher address, which is yeah f's and then eight and all zeros is yeah they add the two on the end. And then I'll just go back so I don't blind myself. Okay, so that seems to work. So I want to try it with other things that aren't just an elf file, try it with a PE file. Okay, and that has E2D7000 and E2D9, so still an offset for the entry point of 2000. And that works, all right, cool. And I wanna try a flat binary as well. I'll show this one again. And that one just starts at the start of the buffer, so it doesn't have an offset for the entry point. It's at the start of the buffer. So it's the same. It's just the regular high-level kernel start address. And that works. Okay. So that's not going to say that it's going to work on hardware, but as far as emulation right now, it does work. I've had issues on hardware where it doesn't fully shut down. It's on a laptop, desktop, other platforms, other laptops. Specific machines might behave differently or have different UEFI setups. I might need a BIOS update from Dell in the past five years, probably. <laughs> I think I might have updated once, but it was still like a year or two ago. They probably have newer updates for the BIOS. That may or may not fix the issue. But I have update, I mean, I have had issues in the past where the shutdown does not work from testing. Um, after jumping to the kernel and setting new page tables and everything. So I set a new runtime address map, and after that point, the shutdown doesn't work. Now, the other stuff does. Get time works, and I believe the boot variables are still able to be viewed and manipulated, but the shutdown didn't work, which ACPI mentions can be an issue, so I think it's an ACPI thing. Uh, but anyway, if you put if you put it into a halt state, at least on my laptop, then I mean it'll stay on, but it'll be in a low power state and you can just like turn it off. So that's probably what I'm going to do. Because that seems reasonable to me. So I'll just do a CLI, even though I already did one, it's fine to run it again, just to be sure. We'll do a, a CLI and halt is fine. So, and this also shows, yeah, I can use a semicolon instead of just doing like new lines here, but I just think this looks a little more slick. Uh, okay. So this is in case, I'll just do that. This is in case my hardware, let's say laptop, doesn't shut off from reset system. It could also halt on this and not get to this point anyway, so I have to check that again. If it does, then all I'm going to do is just comment this line out, and I'll have to use the power button manually. can still use power button manually to shut down. Fine, yeah. So I'll just leave that here for my laptop, but I'm going to test and see if it works with the runtime services reset system. Probably won't. And if it doesn't, I'll just comment that out. So that's all I'm really going to do here. Um, and I'll show footage of that. But other than that, uh, I think we're good for loading, mapping to a higher address. If stuff messes up, then, you know, I'll have more video from this point. But <laughs> right now, I think we're okay with that. Hopefully I went over it in a decent manner. I know I talk too much and try to explain too much. This is a long video. It's going to be cut up into two or three parts just for my sanity and not to have like four hours at once. Yeah, inline assembly is fun. You could also, for an easier time, just put this in a separate .s file or what have you and, and link it in or even use a, um, Intel syntax and have it be easier to read there too, but that's fine. So hopefully that explains some things. Where do I go from here? Um... 
I want to look at boot variables because I wanted to do a, a bootloader and, and install it to another disk, which I have done before, but I haven't messed with boot variables before. So I want to at least print those out, see what's available. And those are from runtime services as well, which are, I think, yeah, variable services. So we can get variables and, and set values there effectively. And using get and set variables, these will be the non-volatile memory variables, nvram vars, or nvvars. And some of these will be boot variables, which this doesn't talk about. But I think we have to use get and set variable, or at least query info and get other things from there, because it's not available in the other ones. But since operating systems and grub and stuff can do it at runtime, it's probably from the boot services, probably from get and set variable. And that's, I think it's gone over in the overview in here somewhere. It might talk about them. I don't remember actually, maybe it's boot manager. I mean, that would make sense. So I know it talks about boot and it's got like four hash signs for numbers. Yeah. So those should be available as variables and the boot numbers will be like the boot order that is set. So boot manager programming is in 311. Okay, so it's under boot manager. Yeah, then, well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, launching boot options with hotkeys. So I'll have to read this a little bit more. But essentially, by yeah, by using set variable, you can change the environment variables, such as boot number, 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 number. And this will be like boot 0001234, it's in hex, etc. And those will be the options that you see, like if you press F12 on start when you boot your machine, and you can choose, you know, from a boot menu, for example. Those will, I think those correspond to these boot number variables. I'm not positive, but that's what I think happens. And if we set a new order, like a boot, there's a boot order variable, in fact, I think. Yeah, there's a boot order variable. So I think if we use set variable on that and we add an option, we add a new variable for like a boot number, then we should be able to set the boot order as long as we set that variable correctly to, I don't know, might be a string or something. But if I can find out that info, set a new boot variable to point to our bootloader that we load and sort of copy to memory and then write to another disk using like disk IO protocol, then we should be able to write a more full functioning bootloader. And maybe even I can add like a menu option to set and change these boot numbers too. And you could be like, okay, I want to boot this, reboot, and see if that works. That might be too ambitious, so I might pare that down. But right now, that's that's what I might try to do next. Set the boot variables, maybe print more ACPI info off camera, maybe print the boot, make a menu option to print the boot variables on or off camera. I don't know yet. But I might do that next. And making a full bootloader after that, I don't know... If there's anything else I want to do... Oh, I wanted to mess with fonts. So I'm not printing anything out in the kernel because I have to make, like, for example, a boot mapped, a boot mapped, a bitmap font and then print it to the screen by reading the bits and choosing colors and all that, which I've done before. But there, there is HII info and there are protocols, which I don't know if they're supported on my hardware and emulation or not. I have to check, but... We have protocols for strings and fonts and stuff, which give you info, and they give you glyph info, they give you font info, and there should be a default system font, otherwise you can't print anything out. So we're printing to console out, that uses a font stored somewhere, and it is a bitmap font from the UEFI spec in this sort of section of the specification. I've seen these data structures, I haven't used them, you know, they might be clunky and everything. But there is at least info for these things, you can generate glyphs, so I could like call that and just write to generate a bitmap of the characters for a whole string and stuff. And we can see what the font looks like. And we should be able to get font info into a data structure too. And the font infos will have pointers to the bitmaps for the font, or at least the characters in there. So I'm going to try to get the system font and the bitmaps for that and then save it in memory and pass it to the kernel or something as an extra parameter to kernel parms. So if that all works, then the kernel can have a font and the bitmaps, and then I'll use the, the provided data structures or some other way to save the info, like the width and height, assuming it's monospace. And then we can use that instead of generating a bitmap font, I can add code to print one. And we can print it from like the loaded kernel. That might be the other thing I do, that and the boot variables and making a 
an actual bootloader to write to another disk and load this OS. I think that's all I want to do. If I still want to after that, and it's not like two years from now when these videos come out, then maybe I'll mess with HTTP or other things that are in this spec, because it has Pixie Boot and stuff. Maybe the platform things, if I want to like sign my keys and use the trusted platform module and everything, TPM stuff. I don't know if I want to mess with that. Secure boot and driver signing. So I know Linux and OSs have to do this as well. I'm just not sure if I want to go through this whole thing because there's a lot There's a lot that's involved with making and signing your image, it seems like. But it probably would be good because I haven't seen too much info on that online, on actually implementing that. So I might look at that. But yeah, I'll plan on boot variables next. If that goes well, maybe fonts making a full bootloader. Uh, yeah, printing the font, getting the info, and then maybe the TPM stuff, or HTTP or some other stuff after, but that's what I'm planning on doing. And I've talked long enough, so anyway, thanks for watching. You can actually boot and remap and page memory and stuff now, so hopefully that makes more sense. That is x86 only. It's not ARM. So possibly in the future, probably off camera, I might reconfigure things and um, abstract this stuff out into like Arch-specific folders in the repo so that it would be easier to interchange that with ARM and ARCH64 and, and RISC-V and whatever architectures are supported that aren't just 64-bit x86. So I might do that later. I might do that later, so that's all I got for now. I've talked too long, and yeah. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it, and cheers. Thank you.